Okay, well, everyone, welcome to the first of the Friends of the Bodley uh, lunchtime lectures for this term. These lectures are open to everyone as part of the public benefit of the charity, but of course we have many events that are exclusive to members, and if there are those in the audience who are thinking of becoming members, we have brochures here and you can go online. Just to give you one example, at the coming AGM on the 25th of June, we shall have the poet, uh, we shall have the novelist Margaret Drabble uh, speaking to us, but that, that will be for members, for members only. Now, today, I am absolutely delighted to welcome our most distinguished speaker, uh, Frank Close, who is Emeritus Professor of Theoretical Physics and Emeritus Fellow at Exeter College since 2001. And he'll be well known to many of you for his numerous, very elegant books on popular science, including The Void, The Infinity Puzzle, and Antimatter. And I should tell you that uh, some time ago I saw a very poor Dan Brown movie and asked one of my colleagues at Merton, the physicist, was it possible to carry a bucket of antimatter into the Vatican? And by way of response, they gave me Frank's book on antimatter which I then read, so I now know it is not, in fact. <laughs> Prior to 2001, Professor Close was head of theoretical physics at Rutherford Lab on the Harwell campus, a post that in 1949 was held by Klaus Fuchs, the atom spy. Um, Frank got his DPhil from Oxford in 1970 when Rudolf Piles, father of the atomic bomb, was professor. Many of Pahl's papers, including communications with uh, Fouche, are housed in the Bodleian. And today, um, Frank will reveal some of these to us. These are documents which helped him research his latest, highly acclaimed book, Trinity, The Treachery and Pursuit of the Most Dangerous Spy in History. And uh, copies are available uh, in Blackwell's, if anyone wishes to get one afterwards. So I would ask you to give a very warm welcome indeed to Professor Close. Thank you very much. Um, I mean, I should start by thanking innumerable people here in the Bodleian that helped me over the last several years uh, in the research. Too many to name, but I would like in particular to, to mention Colin Harris, who's here. Um, as we will see, uh, there's a wonderful collection of photographs that uh, Chris Fletcher, who's in Exeter College, told me about two to three years ago. And Colin and I, I think the best of the whole of the research was the day that we cracked the code which showed how to work out which negatives corresponded to which pictures in this. And, uh, well, you'll see the benefits of that. Let me just give you some background to this before I focus in on the, the Bodleian contribution. So, um, Rudolf Piles, or, or Rudy, uh, he was the Wickham professor here from 1963. And uh, he has been widely acclaimed as being the greatest theoretical physicist never to have won the Nobel Prize. Uh, for today's talk, I think perhaps the two things really to bring out are that in 1940, uh, he was, if you like, the father of the atomic bomb, and I will explain what I mean by that uh, in a moment, and also became mentor to the atomic spy, Klaus Fuchs. And uh, the reason that I called the book Trinity w was twofold. One was that Trinity was the code name for the first test of the atomic bomb in 1945, but also there's a sort of slight, you could say the religious aspects, the Father, Son and Holy Ghost, that uh, Piles was by regular acclaim the, the father of, of the atomic bomb. Klaus Fuchs, uh, who was his assistant, lived with the family in their home in Birmingham initially, became almost a member of the family and was described as almost like a son. So there's the father and the son. There isn't any Holy Ghost in this, but there are the spooks uh, of MI5 and FBI, uh, because one of the things that fascinated me when I was doing the research, uh, as we will see, was that the reason that Fuchs eventually got caught was that some mention of him in some Russian coded cables were deciphered by GCHQ and pointed to either Piles or Fuchs being a spy. And I was fascinated to know how the security services eventually decided, indeed, th that it was Fuchs and not Piles. So to give a bit of a flesh, uh, the, the outline, and then we'll move in on it, um, Piles had the idea of the atomic bomb in 1940. By 1941, um, he was desperately in need of an assistant, and that is how Klaus Fuchs came to work with him. 
They were both, uh, they had both fled from Germany, uh, from Nazi Germany, Piles because he, he was Jewish, Fuchs because he was anti-Nazi, as we will see. And initially at the University of Birmingham, they worked for two years working out the theory of how to enrich uranium into a form that could be used to make a bomb. And the experimental tests of that theory were done up, up the road here uh, in the Clarendon lab uh, initially. By 1944, uh, the whole project moved across to North America. And Fuchs and Piles were part of the British delegation that went across there. And Fuchs continued passing information to the Russians, initially from New York. And then they all moved to Los Alamos, where the bomb itself was constructed. The bomb was tested, used over Japan. At the end of the war, Fuchs stayed in Los Alamos for one further year. And then he came back to Harwell, the new laboratory just down the road here from Oxford, which was developing the beginnings of, of nuclear power. And he continued passing information to the Russians. And by this stage, we're now in the Cold War. I mean, during the war itself, the Russians at least were allies, whereas in the post-war period, the Cold War was beginning and it was a very different kettle of fish. So from 1941 to 1950, Fuchs was passing information for nine whole years on the atomic bomb and the emerging uh, knowledge of nuclear power to the, to the Russians. And he would have got away with it had it not been for the fact that in August 1949, um, some decryptions were finally successful of Russian cables. One of these referred to an agent by codename REST. All that it was possible to deduce about REST was that he was a British scientist who had been working on a particular area of science in New York, and it was either Piles or Fuchs. One of the things I discovered, but not from the Bodleian, unfortunately, um, for 60 years, it has always been believed that it was J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI, the National Security Agency in the States, that were the prime movers in cracking the codes that led to Fuchs' exposure. And I discovered that is not the case. It was actually GCHQ that were key to this. And uh, I'll say no more about that. If you want to know more about it, you can, of course, read about it in the book or ask me in private. But today, uh, as far as I know, there's nothing in the Bodleian about that, but who knows what might still be buried there. So <laughs> let's get into uh, the, the story for us to introduce the characters. Uh, Rudolf and Jenny Piles uh, were both Jewish. He was German, she was Russian, uh, and they fled from uh, Germany in 1932 uh, for racial reasons. Klaus Fuchs was born in 1911. He was Lutheran. He was a social democrat and an anti-Nazi. Now, in 1933, when the Nazis took over in Germany, the communists were the only people prepared to put candidates up against them in the elections. And that is how Fuchs then became involved as a student activist and eventually a member of the Communist Party. He was then on a Gestapo hit list, and he was tipped off that the Gestapo were about to arrest him, and he managed to escape. And uh, he escaped initially to uh, France, and then came across to Britain, to Bristol. And that is where he was when the war began. Now, this is for some reason frozen. Good. OK. So um, we now come to the first of the documents that are in the Bodleian. Uh, the original idea that led to the atomic bomb. 1940, in Birmingham, um, Rudolf Piles and, and Otto Frisch, another emigre from Germany, uh, had the insight. That the idea of nuclear fission had been discovered in 1938. That was well known. People thought it might be possible to build what we now call a nuclear reactor if you had tons of the stuff. But the idea of making a nuclear explosion seemed to be impossible then Piles realised that if you could enrich this uranium, there are about seven atoms in every thousand of uranium are special, uranium-235. And they are the bits that are potentially explosive, but there are only seven in every 1,000. If you could enrich the uranium to have more of that stuff, how much would you need to make an explosion? And the shock was when they discovered that the size of a grapefruit would be sufficient to make a nuclear explosion. And that was the moment when the whole project that eventually led to the atomic bomb began. And Frisch and Piles wrote a memorandum, and there's a photocopy uh, there of part of their memorandum from the uh, 
Bodley in here. They actually wrote two memoranda, one a technical version and one a shorter pedagogic version for the use of politicians uh, and others. Um, the technical version is the one that we have here in the Bodleian. The pedagogic version is in the National Archives in Kew. And I'll just quickly give you three bits from this. Remember, this is 1940. And they've discovered the idea of an atomic bomb. As a weapon, the super bomb would be practically irresistible. That's the very first thing that they say. There is no material or structure that could resist the force of the explosion. So that's the first thing that has frightened them. Owing to the spreading of radioactive substances with the wind, the bomb could probably not be used without killing large numbers of civilians, and this may make it unsuitable as a weapon for use by this country. And then the third point, if one worked, at the moment they have discovered this, the immediate panic is, I mean, anybody who's done research knows you hit your head against the wall trying to solve a problem. The moment you've solved it, it seems so obvious, you wonder why it took so long. <laughs> so Frisch and Piles have now realised the answer, and the immediate thought is, has Germany already got this far? And so they then say, if one works on the assumption that Germany is or will be in the possession of this weapon, it must be realised that no shelters are available that will be effective and could be used on a large scale. The most effective reply would be a counter threat with a similar bomb. So in 1940, in this memorandum, they have already had the idea of what we now call mutually assured destruction. And it was the fear that the Germans could be developing this weapon that led to the whole project, which was originally known as Tube Alloys, and then became the Manhattan Project. Now, by May 1941, the work was getting so intense that Piles was needing an assistant. He knew of Klaus Fuchs, and Fuchs came and joined him as an assistant and lived in the house with them uh, as a member of the family, like a son. And uh, I thought we might start by just hearing Rudolf Piles from the archives here uh, saying it himself, how he hired Fuchs, and in the second clip, some comments about their politics. I knew him before the war when he was first graduate student in Bristol. Uh, we had common interests, and uh, I knew some of his work, which we discussed, and I came to respect him as a scientist. So when we needed more people uh, in uh, 40, uh, I decided to ask whether he'd like to work with us on uh, theoretical work relating to atomic energy, atomic bombs. I couldn't tell him that, of course, unfortunately. So I told him it was something important for the war. And he came, and uh, certainly was extremely useful. He was able, he was quick on the uptake, flexible, and willing to look at, at new problems. From that point of view, I don't think I could have made a better choice. Uh, uh, we had a very big house in all the effects. Uh, it was there anyway. Uh, so he stayed with us. The main item in politics was the war at that time, and uh, therefore everybody had the, the same view. Other things must have come up, I don't recall, but uh, certainly. Uh, there were political discussions in his presence, and he managed then and later to give the impression that he shared everybody else's view. See, I would have guessed at that time that he probably was somewhat to the left of our views, but in a way it switched. So that's Piles. The little icon, whenever you see the Bodleian Library's icon, that means it's from the, the archives here. So that is Piles' view of Fuchs. Now, Fuchs was already a member of the Communist Party. He didn't tell anybody that, obviously. Um, and I was astonished that in the National Archives, the, there are 25 volumes of MI5 files on Fuchs. And the very first entry in all of those volumes is a letter from 1934 um, in which the German police have pointed out that Fuchs was in the Communist Party and that they had found books of the Communist Party in Fuchs's house when it was uh, raided. But the security authorities completely disregarded this because it originated with the Gestapo. 
and therefore they regarded it as not trustworthy. And the great irony is that throughout the whole of Fuchs's career, every time he was vetted, initially when he started with Piles, secondly when he moved across to North America, thirdly when he went to Los Alamos, fourthly when he came to Harwell post-war, on each and every occasion this was disregarded because it came from the Gestapo. The, uh, so he's now working with Piles uh, from May 41. In June 41, the uh, pact between the Soviet Union and Nazis broke down, so the Soviets now became our allies. Churchill gave a speech on the old home service, Radio 4 as it now is, in which he said that Stalin is now our ally and we will do everything we can to help. And I think Fuchs took that as a call to arms and started spying. And for the first uh, year or so, uh, there's the famous story of how he used to meet what was called the girl from Banbury, Ursula Kuzinski, uh, who was uh, the chief uh, illegal for the uh, GRU network uh, of the Soviet Union here during the war. Um, she lived uh, up the Woodstock Road for a while, then in Kidlington, and then the time when she was dealing with Fuchs was nearer to Chipping Norton, great role right. And she would go to Banbury and Fuchs would come from Birmingham to Banbury and they would meet and uh, he would pass information to her and she would ship it across to uh, the, the Russians. And one of the fascinating questions to me had always been, well, how did Fuchs manage to do this? He's living in the Piles house. He has to get away, have a good reason to be out going off to Banbury in the middle of the wartime to meet this woman. And indeed, I've now found an answer, at least on one occasion, thanks to some papers that are here in the Bodleian. Um, the bit at the bottom there is not from the Bodleian. That is a transcription of some KGB files. The report on uh, Fuchs passing information via, uh, via Sonia, as she was known. Um, what's interesting is the date at the bottom. Uh, he passed information on five occasions to her. One of them was 12th of July 1943. I've highlighted that one. On the 12th of July 1943, information was passed to the Soviet Union from the Soviet Embassy. So Fuchs had given that information to Sonia some days before that. Here in the Bodleian Library, I decided to tackle things in two ways. One was to look at every entry in the index under Fuchs. And then I also decided I would look at everything under the dates covering from 1941 through to 49. And uh, in 1943, July, I found two very interesting letters. So remember, 12th of July is the date when this information has been passed from Sonia. On the, you can read it better than me, on the 6th of July, uh, Professor Hoon Rothery, who was actually a chemist here at Oxford, has been writing a book and uh, he's wanting it to have some checks made, and he writes to Piles, uh, and the suggestion's been made that perhaps Fuchs might check some of the equations in this book. And Piles, on the 8th of July, replies that Fuchs is on holiday this week. So his holiday obviously include a meeting with Sonia. So that's at least on one occasion is how he covered his tracks. You know, completely innocent letters until you happen by total chance to notice the dates corresponding with other things. So that is, uh, you know, after the event, we know how he did it on one occasion. Was he always able to keep himself so in the, in the clear? Well, not according to Jenny Piles. And this fascinating uh, uh, interview with her is in the Bodleian Records. Any of you who ever heard Jenny speaking will be looking forward to hearing to her unique style of speaking English. Yes, I could nearly always associate his fine activities, say when he went first time to the Russian embassy, when he went to meet his contacts in Los Alamos and in New York and so on. I could pinpoint them because nearly always after these events he developed a nice decor. It uh, didn't usually have much temperature, or practically never any temperature, but he would lie in bed, cough, looking very miserable, 
and paid the price. And that, but at that time, now I can't, that it was too far, I can't remember exactly, but then it struck me that probably it was subconscious and because he was feeling bad in a way that he was, that he was betraying his friend. Because I was looking, it was kind of just self-punishment, psychosomatic self-punishment. I certainly did. The, the next clip from Jenia um, is a description of Fuchs as a man who would hardly think that this is what a spy should be like. Let me play this next one. What happened afterwards, thinking about his activities, the fact that he drank like a fish, which I saw him drinking, but in like one got a bottle of vodka. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose you have to relax if you're a spy. <laughs> Uh, so th that was uh, the, the first period of his spying, um, the time in Birmingham. Um, there's nothing in the files here uh, about the time when they're in America um, that you have to you go elsewhere. Um, then uh, they all came, the, the war was over. Um, Piles returned to Birmingham University. He didn't come to Oxford until 63. Um, and Fuchs came to be head of the... Uh, Theoretical Physics Department at Harwell. Uh, thank you very much in the introduction for not introducing me like somebody did said that I was successor to Hapkus Klaus Fuchs, uh, <laughs> which I wasn't quite sure if that was a good thing or not. Um, and so what, uh, what I wanted to show you now is, is something remarkable uh, in the modelling collections. Uh, Chris Fletcher uh, at Exeter College told me two or three years ago that the, the Bodleian had managed to purchase or were in the process of purchasing a photographic collection from a scientist the name of Tony Skirm. Now, Tony Skirm was a member of the British delegation uh, in New York and Los Alamos, and he was an avid photographer. Very high quality photographs. I mean, you'll be able to see later the, this lovely American collection in, in this one here. The other folders are more classic 1950s. British type of photographic books. But in the books here are little contact prints that he has made, which are sort of have limited use and help. Um, but there is an extensive index uh, of all of the, uh, the images that he's taken. Uh, it includes his comments on uh, uh, how good they were. And among them, eventually, uh, in fact, uh, Colin noticed that there was some there, like Rudy on skis, um, and Jenny and Klaus on skis, and so on. So there was clear reference to photographs of the piles. And it turns out in 1947, um, Klaus Fuchs hardly ever took any vacation. And the one occasion he did in 47, he went on a skiing holiday with the piles family and uh, with Tony Skirm. And Tony Skirm recorded this uh, in photographs. Um, that was the good news. You find in here a little thumbnail picture um, of uh, Jenny Piles and Klaus Fuchs on, on skis. Um, but actually, that was rather limited value because it was so small, even you know, taking a photograph of it wasn't very good. Uh, and then uh, Colin noticed you know, that there was whole folders full of negatives. And I think my sole contribution to the Bodleian archives research was the day that we cracked the code to show how the Tony Skirm's list of negative numbers could be used to find the relevant negatives in the back. Well, it was possible to find to within five negatives in a little sack. Then you had to put them on a light box and try mentally to imagine them the other way around as to which is the one you're looking for. And eventually we found them. And the quality of the images is remarkable. I mean, here is a photograph of Jenia and Klaus. And in fact, I have got that particular book open at that page. You can look at it afterwards. But to show you the quality of it, once you've got the negative, you can then have that printed up, and the Bodleian did. And you can zoom in and just look at the quality. You are able to see the faces of Jenia Piles and Klaus Fuchs's face in that image that was taken by Skirm uh, out there on the ski slopes. You see them all uh, resting, that is Klaus Fuchs lying on a rock, while behind him Rudy Piles is, whether he's taking a photograph or having a drink, I don't know, but they're having a rest. 
during this trip. To me, the most fascinating one, because of the story with it, I is this picture here, which is uh, Rudy Piles in the front. You can see Klaus Fuchs off on the left, and next to Klaus Fuchs is Ronnie Piles. That was Piles' uh, son. And then behind him is Jenny Piles and their daughter, Gabby. Now, of those people, Gabby Piles is the only one still alive. She's uh, 89, living in the States. And she was totally unaware of these photographs. And she told me a story which had nothing to do with them, but it was about Klaus Fuchs. And then you'll see why I'm telling you this story. She said that Klaus Fuchs really was a member of the family. And she and her brother Ronnie loved him because he was unusual. He was one of the very few adults that treated them like grown-ups. And that they loved him. And she particularly remembered how kind he was because once they were on a skiing holiday in Switzerland and they had been on a sort of long, long hike and her younger brother was getting very tired and falling behind. And she said, my father was beginning to get cross. And Klaus Fuchs stayed with my brother and urged him on. And there you've got the picture. In fact, as we zoom in, you can almost see there is, Ru there is Rudy you know, striding on, wanting them to keep coming. And in the background, there is Klaus Fuchs with Ronnie. And zoom in further and even further. I mean, the quality in this picture is remarkable. You can see Fuchs's face. You can see Ronnie Piles's face on that particular trip. So that's another sequence of things that uh, I had great fun with Colin uh, going through. And you can have a look at the, the folders there. Uh, the, the next sequence uh, of things that came out of the Bodleian was uh, something totally unexpected. Um, I found some evidence of spying that Fuchs did that has never been recorded before. Um, and it's all lying there in the Bodleian, except you would never know it was unless you stumbled on it by accident. And only then, well, I'll tell you how it came about. I said that I went about looking for everything with Fuchs's name in, but I also looked for everything and certain spans of dates. And in the course of this, I found something as a scientist which was very interesting. And then, as you will see, two completely different strands came together. So I was wanted to find out what was the science that was going on between 1946 and 1950? And that was why I was looking at everything I could find in the Bodleian Piles papers. And I found this very fascinating thing in March, the 8th of March, 1946, a letter to Rudy Piles from uh, G.P. Thompson of Imperial College. G.P. Thompson won the Nobel Prize for physics. Um, and he has, he has had the idea, which is key to what we now do down the road at Cullum, of nuclear fusion. And uh, he's had a very deep insight, but before he goes public with it, he wants to check that he's not going to make a fool of himself, so he wrote to Rudy Piles to consult him. Uh, Dear Piles, it's interesting how they wrote in those days. You know, you wrote to your friends by their surnames. Dear Piles, um, I send you here with a manuscript in the hope that you will look through it. It contains some ideas on the generation of nuclear energy, blah, blah, blah. That is what we all know of fusion to be today. That was not the reason why Thomson was excited or concerned. And I'd often wondered why it was that fusion was declared secret. I mean, what's the big deal there? The answer is that as well as producing energy, it produced neutrons. And neutrons were the things that were required to convert uranium into plutonium to make bombs. And in 1946, they were building this huge nuclear reactor up in Cumbria, uh, Windscale, or Sellafield, to do that very thing. And Thompson's insight was that if you could make nuclear fusion, you could make the neutrons to make the plutonium much easier. He says, it would be a formidable source of plutonium using very little uranium. That is why he has written to Piles because of this possibility that here is a way of making the means to make bombs. 8th of March, 1946. Totally unrelated to this, 9th of March, 46, a student named Jerry Gardner is writing to Rudolf Piles, 
uh, this student was at the University of Southampton. He wanted to join Piles at Birmingham to do a PhD. And he's arranged to come and see Piles to that end. And indeed, Jerry Gardner indeed visits Piles, and you can go through the letters and correspondence. And Piles says, uh, there are some interesting questions here. I don't want secret work done in my department, but I'm sure we'll be able to find some things for you to work on. And indeed, uh, Jerry Gardner gets put to work on basically the idea that G.P. Thompson has just discussed with Piles. Two months later, Fuchs returns from America and visits Piles for the weekend. Those papers aren't in the Bodleian. We don't know what was said, but you can guess. Uh, because it becomes clear then that Jerry Gardner goes and works at Harwell with Fuchs. Um, and he writes his thesis. And in 1948, there's this lovely letter in the Piles papers here. Uh, the registrar at the University of Birmingham is returning here with, please receive Dr. Fuchs's report on Jerry Gardner's thesis. So, Gardner has done his thesis on this. Fuchs has been the uh, person who's examined the thesis, and Gardner's got his degree. Wonderful. Um, January 1950, shortly before Fuchs is arrested, um, Jerry Gardner writes a letter to Rudy Piles, full of concern. Dear Prof Piles, I have come across a Russian paper which appears to cover substantially the same ground as my thesis, which was published a year before. It is clear that Fuchs had passed this information <laughs> across there as well. Um, in fact, the, the missing links on this, G.P. Thompson's papers are in Trinity College, Cambridge Library, and indeed you can put the whole paper trail together. It was quite a fascinating thing, but it all started, it was the Bodleian what done it. Um, so now poor old Jerry Gardner, he's there working in the theory group <laughs> at uh, Harwell. Um, it's a total disaster. Fuchs is arrested and sent to jail. Fuchs's deputy, a man called Oscar Booneyman, is wanting to leave because his wife Mary is having an affair with a junior member called Brian Flowers, uh, who some of you may know became Lord Flowers, the rector of Imperial College London, etc., etc. Um, and Jerry Gardner, not surprisingly, wants out. Um, and so he then writes to Piles about uh, leaving Harwell, and Piles, you know, offers to be a referee. Uh, those of you who knew Piles will be amused. This is typical Rudy Piles in his response here. Um, if you do decide to apply for anything, you can certainly give my name as a reference, but certainly not that of Fuchs. I do not think many people will be broad-minded enough to pay attention to a recommendation <laughs> written in prison. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, this is all being wise after the event. Um, what did Rudy actually feel at the time of the arrest? I mean, this is where I want to now move towards the, the personal elements of these things, about when he was arrested. Men shock, and uh, at first I, I refused to believe it. Uh, when the first news came, there was some mix-up about the first, and I thought maybe it was somebody else. And then, when it was clear, obviously it was him. Then we thought maybe there was some misunderstanding. In fact, he had had another breakdown and had imagined things or, or, or had exaggerated the importance of some little slip that he made. So it took a long time for us actually to convince ourselves. It, it, it was a total shock. Here is a person who has not just been your technical assistant and colleague for nine years, but has been living with you as a member of the family. We've seen how his Piles' daughter testified to me this fact, the important role that Fuchs played in the family. And now you discover that all along, He's been cheating, not just the nation, but you personally. And that was a huge shock. Um, what I really now come to, though, is I say here a letter that changed history. Um, it's on the visualizer as well. It, this is not the letter that changed history. The letter that changed history is the letter that Jenny wrote to Klaus Fuchs in response, in part, to this. So I'll tell you the, the saga. So um, Fuchs is in jail. And if you start reading that letter, it is fascinating because you see that he says, it was wonderful of Rudy to visit me on Saturday, although I couldn't do anything to cheer him up. False humour. Um, do you mind if I talk of other things? Sometime I shall try and uh, describe to you 
what went on in my mind, but you will have to wait for this. Then he says, I have been sitting here some time now trying to think when your letter arrived. So imagine stopping. F Fuchs has written those first two paragraphs and then a letter from Jenny Piles has arrived. And uh, it is really not legible on here other than to show you that the great thing about uh, Piles's was that they kept copies of everything that they wrote. So you actually have, you know, a bit like sometimes you hear one half of a mobile telephone <laughs> conversation. Well, you've got it all here. You've got the piles of outgoing letters, um, uh, and, and here they are. But I will uh, just read you some things from her letter, because this, I think, is perhaps one of the most remarkable letters that I have ever read, and the editor at uh, Penguin said we had to have the complete letter on display. This is the letter, basically, that broke Klaus, Klaus Fuchs, and as we turn over the page of Klaus Fuchs's letter, and eventually we will look at it, uh, we, we can see the effect it had on him. So she's writing to him. I'm writing to you in front of our sitting room fire, where we so often talked about so many things. This is a hard letter to write, perhaps even a harder one to read but you know me well enough not to expect me to mince my words. I'm taking it all much easier than everybody else because my Russian childhood and youth taught me not to trust anybody and to expect anyone and everyone to be a communist agent. 20 years of freedom in England softened me and I learned to like and trust people, or at any rate, some of them. I certainly did trust you. Even more, I considered you the most decent man I knew. I do that even now. That is the reason why I am writing to you. You imagine yourself as Klaus Fuchs now. I mean, you're in the ring being hit from both sides. Do you realise what will be the effect of your trial on scientists here in America? Especially in America, where many of them are in difficulties, you know, with the McCarthy witch hunts, which were only then just beginning. Do you realise that they will be suspected, not only by officials, but by their own friends? Because if you could, why not they? For your cause, you didn't have to be on such warm personal relations with them, to play with their children and dance and drink and talk. You're such a quiet man, you could have kept yourself much more aloof. You were enjoying the best of the world you were trying to destroy. It is not honest. Um, he had sort of made out to Rudy Piles when he visited him that uh, he was not wanting to reveal any of his contacts because, you know, uh, he didn't want to give any names away. That wasn't the sort of thing that was done. And she just has nothing to do with this. Klaus, don't be a child. This is the schoolboy code of honour. Impressions don't matter. You personally do not matter. The issues are too important for that, and you know it. Otherwise, you would have taken the easy way out to take your life. Thank you for not doing that. You could not leave all this terrible mess for others to sort out. This is your job, Klaus. Then she ends... Oh, Klaus, my tears are washing away the ink. I was so very fond of you, and I so much wanted you to be happy, and now you never will be. So Klaus Fuchs has received that letter, and then he continues writing his letter from the third paragraph on. And I just highlight at the very end, he writes this sort of PS at the end, uh, sorry I haven't got anybody to type this for me. I hope you can read it, and don't worry if you don't see the tears. I have learned to cry again and to love again, K for Klaus. And the next thing that he did was then he contacted the MI5 people and gave them the information about his Russian contacts in, in America. Carefully, people who he knew were already either out of reach and so forth. But nonetheless, uh, Jenny Piles' letter, I think, had a huge effect uh, upon the course of history. And Klaus's original is here in the Bodleian, and you can look at it on the visualizer afterwards. So moving towards the end, um, you know, what happened next? Well, the fallout for this whole business, if that's the right metaphor, was, was sort of very interesting. Uh, it turns out that Klaus Fuchs had been nominated for Fellowship of the Royal Society uh, by Rudy Piles, and immediately uh, they uh, withdrew the nomination, uh, as you can see, see up there. Uh, as you know, I proposed last year Dr. K. Fuchs for election to fellowship. The proposal was seconded by Dr. Sir John Cockcroft. 
in view of what has happened since then, I feel I should now withdraw the proposal. I have no reason for changing my opinion of the scientific qualifications, but the statement which forms part of our certificate that in our view he deserves the honour of being elected a fellow can no longer be maintained. And the Secretary of the Royal Society says many thanks. Steps to withdraw the certificate will be taken at once. So that was the end of Fuchs's fellowship. Um, the next letter, among many that are there on the file of people writing to piles after Fuchs's arrest, um, really brought home to me as a scientist how loved Fuchs was in the scientific community and how shocked everybody was and how much they realised that the Piles family in particular had been completely undermined by what had happened. Um, the, the letter I'm now going to show you is from Bill Penny, who was in charge of the British atomic bomb project, a project that was totally secret, only a handful of people knew about it, let alone the fact that Klaus Fuchs was in secret the consultant to Penny on the British atomic bomb. The British atomic bomb was completely an open book in Moscow, thanks to Fuchs. Anyway, Bill Penny is now writing to Piles, and I just wanted to bring out the fact, you know, this was the era, I said, where you wrote, you know, dear Piles, dear Piles. And look at this letter. My dear Rudolph. This is, uh, uh, th that speaks volumes on this occasion. Um, this nasty business is now over and I hope that the effects will not last too long. I thought I would like to send you a short note uh, saying something which I find very difficult to express. What I am afraid is that the effect of one man's mistakes may smear others. You can rely on me to do everything that I can to prevent that happening. Best wishes to Jenny. Sorry, I know that that is the wrong spelling. In fact, Rudolph is spelt wrongly as well. It should be F, not PH, but there we are. The left on the right is just there for interest. Um, in 1952, Britain eventually exploded its own atomic bomb. Uh, the design being the one that Fuchs had helped them make. It was the very same design that the Russians used because Fuchs shared it with everybody. Um, and uh, this enigmatic letter from Bill Penny is... Uh, the bomb has been tested, Piles has written and congratulated. I am very pleased to get your letter. Everything went well and we have some most interesting results. If you know what the letter is about, you know what the letter is about. If you don't, you don't. That was very nice. So um, I will come to the end with the tragedy of all of this. Uh, Fuchs is arrested, he's sent to jail for 14 years. He's released in 1959 after nine years for good behaviour. Rudy Piles uh, is alerted to the fact that Fuchs is about to be, arrest, uh, to be released and he sends him a letter, and indeed we've got the carbon copy on, on the front table. Dear Klaus, I see from the papers you are soon going to be released. If you need any help in getting started in life, financial or otherwise, or if you need advice, please let me know. I will do what I can. Yours sincerely, R.E. Piles. There was no response. There was no contact between Fuchs and the Piles for the rest of either of their lives. Fuchs maintained contacts with some of the other scientists in the UK, even with the Harwell security officer who had been instrumental in his exposure and arrest, but he was unable to maintain contact with the piles, and I think this is the nearest we get to really understanding the effect of Jenny's letter. That was the moment when Fuchs felt shame, and I think he could not face the piles, and I think this is a real tragedy, that there was no contact for the rest of their lives. Uh, Klaus Fuchs lived in East Germany. He died in 1988. Uh, Jenia died in 86. Rudy in 1995. Rudy lived to his beyond his 80th birthday. I thought I would end with uh, one other little note that I found in the Bodleian here, which would have slipped by, but it seemed rather appropriate for today. Um, I mentioned Brian Flowers. Uh, he was the very junior member of the theory group at Harwell. Um, he eventually became Fuchs' successor as the head of the theory group at Harwell. And it was quite ironic that they spent two years before they would make the decision who's, who was going to be the successor of Fuchs, given all that had happened. It had to be somebody who was beyond reproach. And the newspapers were very happy because they pointed out that uh, clearly Brian Flowers was beyond reproach because his father was a parson. <laughs> the fact that Fuchs' father had been a parson <laughs> was not noticed. Anyway, um, of course, Brian Flowers had a stellar career. Um, it is also ironic, and as I say in the book here, if Fuchs had kept his mouth shut and not confessed, we would never have known any of this, because 
the only evidence they had against him was the cracked Russian codes. That was such a sensitive secret it could never be used. They had to catch Fuchs in the act of spying or have him confess, and he confessed. If he hadn't have confessed, he would have become a fellow of the Royal Society. He would have become the chief scientist at Harwell. He would have become the father of the British atomic and hydrogen bombs. He would have been in the House of Lords, along with Geoffrey Archer and others. <laughs> but he wasn't. Um, Brian Flowers, of course, was in the House of Lords, and uh, Brian married Mary, uh, the former wife of Fuchs's deputy. Um, Brian and Mary became great friends, as always, with the Piles. Um, and there's this delightful note sent to Piles on his 80th birthday. At fourscore years, one should not think about the dishes in the sink or when to start up a machine which may be full before they're clean. Away with all such foolish doubt, just lick some plates and throw it out. But should these not prove taxing tests, throw a party for 80 guests. <laughs> with love from Brian and Mary, happy birthday. So there it all is. Thank you very much for this. Uh,